center meeting house, side with the one trigger next to the bank. Engine squad! Shoulder! Arms! going on today actually. You can see behind us here we have our cannon out today so we've been firing that doing demonstrations uh, with our 1830s cannon. Um, we also have a wonderful uniform display that's over in our Bullard Tavern that is a, a timeline of American military uniforms uh, basically from the 17th century up to the modern day just about. Um, we've got a surgeon here who represents a surgeon from the War of 1812 from the Constitution. Um, we have some representatives from the War of 1812 Marines here as well um, and we've just got a lot of other program going on. I mean all the museum exhibits are open so it's, it's just a great day to come out. Uh, active service uh, or active duty military members and veterans are all getting in free with their families today as well. uniform collection and what it is friends from 1620 all the way up into the Gulf War. And the reason why we started at 1620 because that was the first militia unit in Massachusetts. When the Pilgrims came over they hired Miles Standish as their militia captain and within 15 years of their landing here more and more militia units started. So we started with four basic militia units. The 181st, the 182nd, the 101st Artillery, and the 101st Engineering Patrols in 1636. And these units are still active today. So we've gone from 1620 to Continental Lines, to the War of 1812, the Mexican War, the Civil War, the Indian War, Spanish-American War, World War I, World War II, all the way over to Korea, Vietnam, Panama, Desert Storm and the Gulf War. So they're all represented right here in uniform. I'm a little girl, a boy, to 
are home to bear Cause there's a new day Waiting just ahead Life is sweet But time is sweet Beneath the magic of the moon Dancing time may seem sublime But it is ended all too soon The thrill has come to linger on But spoil it anyhow Let's creep away from the day For the party's over now Night is over, dawn is breaking Everywhere the town is waking Just as we are on our way to sleep Lovers meet and dance a little Snatching from romance a little Souvenir of happiness to keep The music of an hour ago Was just a sort of Let's pretend The melodies that charmed us so At last are ended The party's over now The dawn is drawing very nice The candles gather The starlight leaves the sky It's time for little girls Welcome everyone, happy Veterans Day. So what I'm firing for you today is a US model 1816 musket. So this is a flintlock musket. It's the standard infantry weapon carried by the US military and a lot of militia companies too in the 1830s. Essentially the way this thing works is this mechanism on the side. So it's called a flintlock because it relies on a small piece of flint, which is a very hard, very sharp rock, to strike a piece of steel. And when it does, it flops the steel forward, generating sparks. The sparks then fall down into a small little depression right there called the pan on the side of the barrel. That will ignite and then burn through the vent into the side of the barrel, setting off the main charge. So to load it, because it is a military gun and I'm here in my artillery uniform, I'm going to use paper cartridges. So this is what they use in the military in the time period. So the paper cartridge has your prime, your main charge, and the projectile you're firing. Now, I don't have the ball with me, but this is a 69 caliber musket, so in the period they're firing around a 64 caliber ball, just a little over 5 eighths of an inch. Just a round lead slug they're firing. So I'm gonna take the cartridge, bite off the end, and pour some powder into the pan for my prime. Shut the pan, and now the rest of the powder will go down. So the ball will be usually tied into the end of these. So at that point, I can just take the whole cartridge, stick it down, and then use the rammer to seat that. Usually just give it two taps, and that's it. So by leaving the paper in there, it actually acts as a wad that will hold the, the projectile in place. Otherwise, with a round ball, I go like this, that could be really problematic. So it helps to hold it in place for firing. Okay, so at this point, the flintlock is ready. I'm gonna give it one more click back to full cock, so it's now off its safety. We'll give it a shot. (laughs) 
So, like I said, this is a military musket. Uh, these were produced at Springfield or Harper's Ferry. They're also produced by all sorts of contractors. People like Eli Whitney, Asa Waters in Millbury, um, Nathan Starr down in Middletown, Connecticut. They're all making these weapons. A lot of them are going to the militia in the period. So, in the 1830s, every white male from 18 to 45 is actively serving in the militia and needs to provide all their own equipment. So you need your musket. You need your bayonet, which goes on the end of the musket and then turns this into a spear. So I've got one shot with the gun, now I have an extra line of defense. So you need a musket, you need a bayonet, you need your cartridge box, which I have back here with all my cartridges in it. You need two or three spare flints, and you need a pick and brush. I don't have mine with me today. Uh, but those are all things you require to have along with a knapsack. Now you show up for a training day two or three times a year, if you don't have that stuff, you're actually fined for it. So it's actually quite a significant financial burden to buy all this stuff and then keep it maintained. Otherwise, you get hit with these fines on training days. So on a, on a militia training day, the goal would be to train all the men in the militia to not only become comfortable with their firearms, but also with the drills. You'd be drilling together in lines, doing your wheels and, and all the rest. Um, and very typically, they would have what's called a sham fight in the afternoon where they would either break up the militia company of one town or have a couple of different companies from the same town or, or different towns. Uh, they would all come together and have essentially a reenactment. <laughs> and so they might even reenact a battle from the revolution or the war of 1812 um, and just try to kind of show off their martial prowess. In a lot of cases, the militia in the time period, in fact, two thirds of the militia in the time period were not uniform companies like I'm representing today. Most of them were what are called enrolled or standing companies. They're average people, they're farmers, they're blacksmiths, they're printers, you know, people of every walk of life that are just mandated to serve. They really don't care, so they don't take it very seriously. And probably the thing they do the best on militia training days is heavy drinking, which is a big problem for the militia. Go ahead and change out my flint. This flint's getting a little dull. So you're relying on a, on a razor sharp edge for your flint for this to actually work. So what I'll do is I'm going to unscrew the top screw. Flint comes out. I've got another one in my pouch here. I got all my buddies to help me out. The thing is, I mean, these weapons get an awful bad rap nowadays because obviously this is very different from, you know, an M4 and things like that. Um, you have to remember, everyone has the same thing. So that really helps to level the playing field. You also have your bayonet. So if you have a real serious issue with your gun, that's your second line of defense. Or chances are there'll be other ones lying on the ground if you're actually in combat. So you can always pick up one of those. All right, so I've got a brand new flint in there. Let's give that a try. God, that is loud. Much better. All right, so like I said, the point of the militia training days is to get you comfortable with the drill, get you comfortable forming an actual military unit, but also they would do target practice, and they're trying to make sure that you can fire in a rapid manner, just like you'd actually do if you were on the field of battle. So a soldier in the time period expects to fire three rounds in a minute. You want to see? Yeah? Okay. Make sure everything's all clean to make this work the best I can. Who has a timepiece? Me. You do? I do. All right. <laughs> The gentleman on top. No. I do. All right. So on your signal, I'll go ahead and begin. Go. Go. Those are musicians. Why would I shoot the musicians? Well, look at that circle. So keep in mind, the only stress I have right now is that you're timing. No one's actually shooting back. But the idea is it to all just be muscle memory. They're fired off a so ring. I don't need to think. Uh, yeah. Where are you shooting? Did you see that there was a Look, he dropped the flint. He should have kept it. The money's going to run off, I think. Smoke oh, Five seconds left. All right, you did it. Cool. So that's what you'd be expected to do on a battlefield. Now, if you've seen movies that show battles of this time period and before the revolution, no one is just standing there and actually doing that. <laughs> no one is standing there, you know, face to face with their opponents, just blazing away. That's a terrible way to run an army. Terrible way. 
So the idea is to do an awful lot more maneuvering. So one thing that's really popular in the period, and actually the vast majority of the volunteer militia companies are what are called light infantry companies. These are meant to basically be kind of mobile units. They're kind of the elites, the flank companies that will be on the ends of the line to help protect the flanks. Um, and they're designed to do a lot more mobile warfare. So the idea of this very slow, kind of lumbering warfare, marching shoulder to shoulder and firing until everyone's gone, it just didn't happen. So it actually was a much more light, kind of lightweight warfare, kind of maneuvering an awful lot more than just blazing away like, like I just did right there. But at least you should be comfortable actually firing in that way. Now, in the military, and even in, in the, the manual for the militia, when they talk about training the men to fire, they actually are talking about firing at targets. And so the standard target that they'd be firing at, we actually have one on display in the militia exhibit down the road there, is roughly 20, 22 inches wide, about 5 foot 10 tall, so it's, it's basically man size, um, and it's broken up into three zones with a bullseye. That is the standard military style target you'd fire at. We shoot at those here on our militia training days at the museum um, in May and in, in uh, September. They actually start firing, at least what the recommendation is in the Army Manual is starting at 40 yards. So firing at that target would actually be pretty doable, pretty easily doable actually with a musket. They actually get the men comfortable to firing up to 140 yards. Now, believe it or not, this is going to be strange to the modern, the modern thought, but that's actually considered to be point blank in the 1830s, right? So we think of point blank nowadays, how close is point blank? It's a couple of feet, exactly. The idea with point blank in the time period is it's the distance that you will fire your musket and the ball will travel on a flat trajectory before it starts to drop. So by training the men to fire at that point blank range up to 140 yards, their sight picture on their musket is the same as if I was firing 20 yards, 15 yards, 50 yards, whatever it might be. Not that they're necessarily going to hit the target every time, but it is something they want to get the soldiers actually comfortable to, to being able to do in the time period. Now we also, for those folks of you who live locally here and can come back on the weekends, we've also been doing turkey shoots. Now these are not military events by any means. They did have target shoots as part of militia musters in the time period, and sometimes they would actually give away a prized musket, this beautiful musket that might have, you know, silver plates engraved on it, like a really, really nice musket to whoever was the best shot. Um, there's other prizes as well. Turkey shoots are a whole lot different. They're a civilian sporting event, basically set up by a tavern keeper, a farmer, a storekeeper, and basically what they do is they would stake turkeys out at 100 to 160 yards, so you could only see the head, and you fire and had to actually hit the thing in the head to win the bird. You pay as much as two dollars, or sorry, as, too much, as much as two days wages for a single shot, and the whole time this guy is probably plying you with alcohol. So these are incredibly unpopular events by the 1830s. You've got a huge social reform wave in the 1830s passing through, everything from temperance to debtor relief. Um, so obviously the temperance is a big part. People hate the fact these animals are being tortured, so they stop doing them for that, or they're, they're trying to get people to stop doing them for that reason. There's gambling going on, and then of course when you mix alcohol and firearms, there's a lot of accidents going on. In fact, there's one accident that's recorded from 1829 from a turkey shoot up in uh, Dummerston, Vermont, which is where the night store came from, where the covered bridge came from. And they actually talk about at a turkey shoot and card playing frolic. A bunch of men got together and they were firing while also playing cards inside the house. Well, one guy accidentally dropped his rifle, it discharged, shot through the wall of the house, hit one man in the leg and then passed into the chest of another man and killed him. So. Whether this is true or not, I can't actually say. It's in the newspaper, but I could also see this being something that someone who was against turkey shoots would put into the newspaper to be like, look at the sin, look at the vice, and what happened to these men. So, just something to keep in mind. Okay, yeah, Service Village, every Veterans Day, what they do is they open up the village to all veterans and all their families free of charge. I participate with them about three or four times during the course of the year. I'm also with the Sturbridge Colonial Militia, which these gentlemen are, are with. And I'm also with these Afton Minutemen, and up until recently, up to the 1812 uh, Marine Constitution Marine Guard. So I stay busy. It <laughs> keeps me out of trouble, or actually gets me into trouble probably more than I
So a lot of the staff, so we actually have our, our gun crew here today is all village staff, um, but we're also blessed to have quite a few volunteers that dedicate a lot of their time and energy to the museum. So um, the musicians that you see here today playing excellent fife and drum music, um, they're volunteers. The gentleman with the, with the uniform display, also a volunteer. Um, so these are people that just really care an awful lot about the nation's history and, and the armed services, uh, many of them veterans themselves. Um, and so they've all come together to help pull off this, this amazing program. One thing that we do here at the museum is we try to really foster a community. Um, so it's not just about coming here and us telling you about how things were in the 1830s, but relating it to your lives today, you know? Um, so any way we can do that, whether it be through foodways or through agriculture or through work, whatever we can do to make that, that relation to people, we can, we can try to take advantage of that. And so, you know, inviting veterans and in their families um, to share their stories and, and to be able to kind of realize the differences between different time periods and the similarities in a lot of ways too. I mean, we, I think we so often think that things were so different back then, but in a lot of ways, there's a lot of similarities. Um, and, and, you know, serving the country is, is still very much the same back then as it was today, or as it is today. Well, it's probably the most important of the day uh, for me. I mean, I spent 19 months in Vietnam, so it means, it means quite a lot to me. And, and, and it's so much pleasant today to watch what the American public is doing to the, uh, to the veterans today. I mean, we just didn't get that. And if you ever watch a Vietnam vet greet another Vietnam vet, they say, welcome home. Because we never got that back then. It's, it, was, it was tough. So that's why it's refreshing to see what they're doing today. So, I mean, just, you know, coming together and, and remembering, you know, the, the men that fought and died for the country or served in general, and women as well, of course. Um, and, and just looking at the history of, of the nation's military as well. I mean, in, in the 1830s, the militia was a huge, huge thing in, in society. Um, and so we use it as an opportunity to talk about that as well as relating it to the modern times and, and going back quite a